In this video, we're going to discuss what is meant by the viscosity of a fluid, and we're also going to look at some of the different methods that can be used in order to measure fluid viscosity. So as a starting point, it's important to understand what we mean by the viscosity of a fluid. On the right hand side we have a short animation where we see two different fluids. We see a fluid with low viscosity on the left, best represented by something like water, and we see a high viscosity fluid on the right, best represented by something like oil. Now in its most simplistic terms, what we mean by the viscosity of a fluid is that it's the fluid's thickness. But we're also going to discuss some other more accurate definitions. So another way to think about viscosity is that it's a fluid's resistance to flow. The higher the viscosity, the more resistant it is to flow, as we see in the case of the oil on the right hand side, and the lower the viscosity, the less resistant it is to flow. So the full and accurate definition of fluid viscosity is a fluid's internal resistance to shear stresses. When a fluid flows through a pipe, we get internal stresses as a result of friction with the surface of the pipe. So the reason a high viscosity fluid is more resistant to flowing through a pipe is because it's more resistant to those internal stresses. So there's two different types of viscosity that we need to be aware of. The first viscosity is called dynamic viscosity. It has the Greek letter mu and it's measured in newton seconds per meter squared. The other type of viscosity that we're going to be discussing is the kinematic viscosity. It's given the Greek letter nu, and it's measured in meters squared per second. So let's discuss dynamic viscosity first of all. As mentioned, dynamic viscosity has the Greek letter mu, and it can be found by doing the shear stress within the fluid divided by something called the shear rate. Let's take a look at a diagram so we can understand each of these terms. In this diagram, we have a fixed plate at the bottom, and we have a plate that's free to move at the top, and in between the two plates is our fluid. So if we want to move this top plate at a given velocity, we're going to need to apply a force, and that force is going to be dependent on the viscosity of the fluid, the desired velocity, and the separation distance here, x, between the two plates. The shear stress then is the applied force divided by the area that's in contact with the fluid. So if we can imagine this top plate will have a width into the page and the area that's in contact with the fluid is the area that we're interested in. The applied force divided by that area gives us the shear stress that's being applied to the fluid. But the other variable, the shear rate, gamma dot, is the velocity of the top plate divided by the distance between the two plates. So the shear rate will be greater if the velocity is greater, or the shear rate will be greater if the separation distance is smaller. It's basically a measure of how quickly the top plate's moving in relation to the distance between the two plates. So if we combine the terms for tor, shear stress, and gamma dot, shear rate, we get the following formula. Dynamic viscosity is force times separation distance over plate area times velocity. The higher the viscosity, the larger the force that needs to be applied. Or thought of another way, the higher the dynamic viscosity, the lower the velocity of the top plate relative to the bottom plate. The other type of viscosity is kinematic viscosity. And kinematic viscosity is relatively straightforward. It's basically the dynamic viscosity divided by the density of the fluid. So it's the dynamic viscosity per unit density. And densities change with temperatures, so again it's another important parameter or another important measure of viscosity. So now we have an understanding of what viscosity is, we can now begin to look at some different ways of measuring the viscosity of different fluids. And we're going to look at three in particular. 
we're going to look at a U-tube viscometer, which is also known as an Oswald viscometer. We're going to look at a falling sphere viscometer, and we're going to discuss a Redwood viscometer. So pictured on the right, we have a U-tube viscometer. Now, the way that the U-tube viscometer works is first of all, we need to input our fluid. And we pour our fluid into the viscometer until the fluid is in line with this lower index mark. So because hydrostatic pressure is maintained, the fluid is also going to fill the lower bowl. We then apply suction to the right hand arm of the viscometer, and we do this until the fluid reaches this upper index mark. When we're ready to begin the test, we release the fluid and we start a stopwatch, and we're timing how long it takes for the fluid level to go from this upper index mark on the upper bulb to this lower index mark on the upper bulb. The reason the flow of the fluid is controlled is because the fluid needs to travel through this narrow capillary as it moves from the upper bulb and into the lower bulb. Once the fluid level reaches or passes the lower index mark, we can then stop the stopwatch and then we can determine the kinematic viscosity of our fluid. Now what this chart shows us is that there's various different viscometers represented by these letters here. And each viscometer comes with a viscometer constant. Each viscometer is also designed to measure between given ranges of kinematic viscosities. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. But if, for example, as pictured, we have an E-type viscometer, we know that the viscometer constant is 0.3. We can then determine the kinematic viscosity using the basic formula, kinematic viscosity equals constant times time in seconds. So in the example here, if we're using an E-size viscometer, we would multiply 0.3 by the time in seconds to get the kinematic viscosity in millimeter squared per second. So it's important to understand that there's quite a few limitations with a YouTube viscometer. First of all, each viscometer is only designed to measure relatively narrow ranges of kinematic viscosities. And the reason for that is low viscosity fluids will travel through a much narrower capillary far more quickly than a high viscosity fluid would. So if we have a high viscosity fluid, then there's no sense in using one of these smaller size viscometers. Something else to consider is these viscometers are not particularly portable, they're made of glass and they're quite fragile. So that may be another consideration if we're looking to measure viscosities of fluids on site as an example. And another important consideration is the cleaning of these devices. Generally they would need to be cleaned with a solution and they would then need to be thoroughly dried before we could test another fluid. So whilst they give very accurate readings for viscosities, there are a number of limitations as a result of their design and their intended operation. Another type of viscometer is called the falling sphere viscometer. And I just have a basic schematic diagram for this one. So in a falling sphere viscometer, we have a small sphere of known diameter and known density. We have a tube with the fluid in which we're going to measure the viscosity. And all we do in this experiment is we drop the ball and when it passes an index mark, we start the stopwatch. And when it passes a second index mark, we stop the stopwatch. You'll notice here that there's a water jacket around the tube and that's so that we can measure viscosities of fluids at different temperatures. Once we have the time in seconds, we can then do our calculation for viscosity. Now the calculation for this is relatively complex because it takes into consideration the diameter of the sphere, the density of the sphere, the density of the fluid, and the time. So the formula itself is beyond the scope of this video, but we can accurately calculate the viscosity of the fluid based on the time for the ball to travel between index marks A and B. Once again, it's important to understand some of the limitations. First of all, we can only really use this method for a translucent fluid because otherwise we wouldn't be able to locate the ball. But aside from that, this is a relatively versatile way of measuring the viscosities of different fluids. The final method that we're going to discuss is the Redwood Viscometer.
Now, a redwood viscometer is relatively versatile, and in a later video, we're going to be demonstrating how to carry out a redwood viscosity test. But let's begin by explaining this diagram. In the center of the viscometer, we have a vessel, and that vessel is going to hold our fluid. We also have a thermometer that's placed inside that fluid so that we can measure the temperature of the fluid within the vessel. On the outside, we have a water bath, and we can adjust the temperature of the water bath in order to adjust the temperature of our solution or our fluid. Now at the bottom of this vessel, we have a small orifice. And in preparation for conducting the test, there's a small ball valve which covers that orifice. When we're ready to conduct the test, all we do is lift the ball valve, start a stopwatch, and time how long it takes to collect 50 millilitres of our fluid in a flask underneath. So once again, we get a time in seconds which relates directly to the viscosity of the fluid. Now, once we have that time in seconds, we can use redwood conversion tables in order to determine our kinematic viscosity. So in the bottom left-hand corner, there's an example of a conversion table. So we have here redwood one seconds, and redwood 2 seconds, and the time in seconds for 50 millilitres of the fluid to flow through the orifice translates directly into our kinematic viscosity in centistokes. Centistokes is the same as millimetre squared per second. So this brings us on nicely to potential limitations with a redwood viscometer. Redwood 1 is for lower viscosity fluids that are less resistant to flow. And Redwood 1 has a smaller orifice plate here. So Redwood 1 is only suitable for lower viscosity fluids, otherwise it would take too long for the fluid to flow into the vessel below. However, there is another type of Redwood viscometer, Redwood 2, and Redwood 2 has a much larger orifice. Therefore, it can be used to measure higher viscosity fluids. We see some examples here. When we have a kinematic viscosity of 151 centistokes, it would take 592 seconds for the fluid to flow through Redwood 1, whereas it would only take 65 seconds to flow through Redwood 2. So we do have that flexibility with the Redwood viscometer. Also, converting from time in seconds to kinematic viscosities is very straightforward. So there are numerous benefits to using a Redwood viscometer. So to summarise, we've seen three different viscosity measurement techniques. We've seen the YouTube viscometer, where the fluid flows from an upper bulb to a lower bulb through a narrow capillary. We've seen the falling sphere viscometer, where a ball of known diameter and density falls through the fluid between two index marks. And finally, we've seen the redwood viscometer, where the fluid flows from an orifice of known size at the bottom of a vessel until 50 millilitres is collected in a conical flask.